And as he pointed out, um, I specialize in building instruments for X-ray astronomy. And today we'll talk about uh, you know, a, an object that gives off X-rays, um, supernovae and their remnants. And so that's uh, what we're going to concentrate. But before we go there, I might as well get to know you a little bit as well. So I know Steve's a professional astronomer, and there's a couple, you know, there's a postdoc and a grad student or two that study astronomy. Um, who, who here are just, you know, would consider themselves amateur astronomers? Anyone? Oh, there, there we go. <laughs> quite a few, quite a few, actually. All right, and so who here have never heard anything about supernovae before in their life? There's got to be a couple. There's one. There's, one. there's a brave soul. <laughs> well, even if you've heard of them or if you haven't heard of them, hopefully some, today I'll give you something that you can take away that you never knew before. So first of all, let's motivate the discussion with uh, why do stars explode in the first place? Because that's what a supernova is, the explosion of a massive star. And we'll go through you know, lifestyles of stars in general. And the reason to, to answer how they die or how they explode, you really have to know how they lived, you know, what's going on during their time. And as they're living, as our own sun is sitting there giving us energy, it's doing so because it's taking hydrogens in its core and slamming them together, and slamming them together to make larger atoms. And when it slams them together, you take four of them, slam them together, you're going to make a helium nucleus. So if you take a look at the periodic table of elements, here's hydrogen, good old number one, single proton. Put four of those together, you're going to get two protons, two neutrons, and a helium. And the curious thing about this situation is that when you weigh that helium atom, the mass per nucleon, or its total mass, is less than you'd expect from the sum of the parts. And so that's less massive than the four hydrogen protons going in to do it. So where does, where does that energy go? The, the, the mass itself is the energy. That difference in mass is supplying the energy, made famous by Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared. So that says that a little bit of mass, that little tiny difference between that helium nucleus and the four protons forming it can get turned into a massive amount of energy. And what's even more interesting is that when you take the look at the mass of atoms, they're extremely, extremely small. You know, minuscule, things of number you cannot fathom. But what's even more interesting is that in our sun right now, at the core of our very own star, it's turning four million tons of mass into energy every second. So that minuscule difference in the minuscule mass of an atom is going to turn into energy to the tune of four million tons per second. So that's a lot of energy. You know, that's, that, that's on a warm summer day, you feeling the warmth on your face. That's where that energy is coming from. As that light comes down and hits you and you feel it, that energy started at the core in this reaction hundreds of thousands of years ago. That's another thing that a lot of people don't know. I mean, it's eight minutes away travel time for light, but the light that gets from the sun actually takes hundreds of thousands of years to make its way out. So when you go outside tomorrow and you feel that sun ray, think about this. That energy was made in copious amounts hundreds of thousands of years ago and is now warming you up. But that's the whole reason why that star lives in the first place, is because that energy the pressure from the light that that reaction creates is combating against the gravitational pressure of the mass itself. That star wants to collapse. That star has gravitational potential energy. And that gravitational potential energy wants to take all that mass and take it right down to the center. But as that hydrogen fusion goes on, as it's creating that helium at the core and creating light, that creates a pressure that buoys up those outer layers from collapsing in. So it forms a nice little equilibrium. There's just enough burning going on at the center to hold back that collapse. And it's a nice equilibrium state. So our sun's been doing that for about 5 billion years. It's going to be doing it for about 5 billion more. But eventually it's going to run out. You can't, it, it, the, the hydrogen goes away. It's not being constantly replenished. 
Now, I wanted to show a movie here of this particular star exploding, but trust me, it explodes. <laughs> the movie didn't, didn't transfer very well. But eventually it runs out, the hydrogen in the core. And what happens, whether it explodes or possibly not explode, all depends on how big the star was to begin with. So that's where we kind of have to start the discussion. So why do stars explode? Well, they run out of fuel, they run out of gas, they slow down. But there's nuances to that depending on how big that star is. So astronomy is, is amazing. I mean, Galileo, the first one to, to publish results on turning a telescope to the skies, but countless astronomers prior to that, all the way to the earliest, earliest humans. I mean, think about it, the sun, the cycle of the sun, of the moon, and not so obvious the planets, meant a lot to everyone all the way down to ancient times. And what's more amazing about astronomy, you go out tonight after this lecture is done, you look up at the sky and you see these little pinpricks of light, and that the entire science of astronomy is gained by just taking whatever photons we can get from these little bits of light that come down to develop new technologies that collect as much light as possible, not only light that we see, but light we can't see, like infrared light, like x-ray light that we'll talk about today, like gamma rays, like radios. So in those little pinpricks of light and those little amounts that you get, you can do a lot with them. And if you go out and look at the stars, and you're an astronomer, you can actually measure their brightness. You can take a spectrum and find out what their temperature is. If you do that for a whole lot of stars and catalog them and put them on a brightness versus temperature plot, you'd see something just like this. And this is known as a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And when you take a look at all these stars, one thing you might notice is along this main sequence, as we'll call it for now, I'll describe it in just a second, you see that there's a multitude of different types of stars, from these little tiny red ones going through stars like our own sun, going up to these big bubbly blue ones. So what's going on there? Well, that's driven by the mass, how big the star is, just like its death is driven by how big it is. Its formation, its life, its death, that's all driven by how much mass it has. So what's interesting, interesting about the main sequence, the main sequence is basically defined on when that particular star is burning hydrogen in its core, just like our sun, just like we just got done talking about. So our sun's burning hydrogen on the core, and sure enough, there it is right on the main sequence. And any other star that's burning hydrogen in its core is going to plop itself down on that main sequence. So as soon as it stops burning hydrogen, as soon as that fuel runs out, quote unquote, runs out, that's when it comes off of the main sequence. That's when it stops its main sequence lifetime. That begins the death of the star. Now, it doesn't die right away. Other things happen. But that's when its main sequence death starts. And you'll notice on this plot, you see things like giants and supergiants, white dwarfs. All these things come from the main sequence. And so how, do a, how does a star evolve? I'll take these lower mass stars here. So things that are roughly two times the size of our sun and less. These are low mass stars. So as they go on in their lifetime, just like our sun, five billion years from now, they're going to run out of that hydrogen. And at the core, you're just going to have this helium, ball of helium at the core. And no longer is that undergoing fusion. So no longer is it sending out a lot of radiation to hold back a gravitational contraction. So that core itself will contract upon itself, get tighter, denser, hotter, forming a tighter and tighter ball. And as it does that, it's going to take some of the hydrogen with it in its local vicinity. And the whole thing's going to start contracting. And then the hydrogen actually starts burning around the core, just like it was burning in its own core. So the temperature gets hot enough to burn hydrogen in this little shell around that helium core. And it just so happens that burning is actually more efficient than initial hydrogen burning at the core when it was on the main sequence. And so you get a lot of light produced. And that lot of light starts pushing out the outer layers more so than it was before, basically growing your star. So as that efficient hydrogen burning is going on around that helium core, and you get lots of luminosity. The brightness goes up, because brightness is on this scale here. The brightness goes up, 
and the size of the star gets bigger. And you start entering what's called a subgiant phase. Now eventually that hydrogen shell is turning itself into helium. That helium gets added to the core and more burns and more helium and more helium and more helium and more contraction and more contraction. And eventually the temperature gets high enough for the helium to start getting forced into one another. So that hap that's a lot harder to do than getting the hydrogen together. You know, opposites attract. Positives like negatives. Positives don't like positives. So two hydrogens coming together are one positive, one positive. That was hard enough. Now you take two heliums, you got two positives going against two positives. It takes a little bit more temperature, a little bit more oomph, a little bit more energy to get those together. So that's what's going on. That's why helium isn't burning right off the bat after it leaves the main sequence. That's why you got that core that's not doing anything with that hydrogen burning around it. But like I said, eventually it's going to ignite. That helium's going to burn. Initially it does so explosively, and you move out of a giant phase down to a, what's called a horizontal branch. And there, that star lives like our sun would live there for only about 100 million years burning helium in its core. Now what does that helium turn into? Well you take three heliums and oddly enough they add up to a carbon. And again that carbon atom is a little less massive than you expect from what you put into the into the mix. And so again you're gonna get an additional energy that comes out in radiation. But then so now here's, here's the, the inside of the star, this low mass star that you should have in your head. That it started with hydrogen burning at the core, that stopped. Then you had a helium core with hydrogen burning around the outside. Then that helium started burning. And you still have that hydrogen shell going. And then you got carbon at the center. Now for stars of this mass, they can't force carbon atoms together or heliums into carbon. The temperature isn't that high. So typically that's where it stops. So you have this inert carbon core, a carbon core that's not doing anything, but then you have efficient helium burning around that carbon core, efficient hydrogen burning around the helium on the outside of that. So you have this layered core. And remember when I said when it was just a helium core, that efficient hydrogen burning pushed off those layers, making it into a giant star? Now imagine if you had a helium, efficient helium shell underneath an efficient hydrogen shell. Your luminosity is huge and you're pushing out with enormous amounts of pressure. You're pushing out so much that you're going to blow away your outer layers. And that actually relieves the gravitational contraction that the core was feeling in the first place. No longer does that have those outer layers pushing in on the core, wanting to contract that core more. What the star has done is produced enough radiation to blow off that gravitational pressure. So now what you're left with, after all the burning gets done, is a really, really dense piece of carbon, a really nice diamond, basically. And you have this big, dense ball of carbon, and you have the outer layers being pushed away by this efficient radiation. And you're left with is what is most commonly known as a planetary nebula. And at the center of that planetary nebula, you have a white dwarf. So a white dwarf, as you can see, will cool with time because all it is is a big chunk of carbon that was once hot. No more energy is being put into the mix. It just cools down over time, slowly dying away into forever darkness. So what does one of these planetary nebulae look like? So as an amateur astronomer, you should be very familiar with M57, the ring nebula. So the ring nebula is a, a, the quintessential type of planetary nebula where you have this central white dwarf object cooling over time. And just prior to this, this strong pressure from this efficient burning has blown the outer layers away. Not exploded them away, mind you. Just blown them away. Just provided some pressure to push them off of. You know, something, if something's on your back, you don't want it on there, you just shove it off. And you're not TNT, you don't explode it off, you just shove it off. That's what this is doing. It doesn't have enough oomph, it doesn't have, you know, it hasn't been working out every day. It can just barely push it off, push it away. So let's take a look at another one. 
This one's known as the cat's eye. You can imagine if you blurred this up a little bit, it didn't have such a nice telescope like the Hubble Space Telescope, which took this one, that you wouldn't have a, as clear a view of this, and you can see why it's called the cat's eye. And what this picture is kind of showing you is that it doesn't have to happen spherically, symmetrically. It doesn't have to be even on all sides of the core. The wind and the pressure does not have to be the same. So sometimes you get some types of jets almost looking like emanating from the central object. Some preferential direction to how things go off. Yes, you had a question? Are those recurrent explosions? Or? No, in this, remember, in a, in a planetary nebula, typically these aren't explosions. But there are episodic wind losses due to wind. So as the, as the core is going through its helium burning stages, both in the core and also in these shells and the hydrogen burning shells, there can be episodic winds where it can slough off material at different times. It doesn't have to be all at the same time. The planetary nebula, you know, the ring nebula really is, you know, the quintessential, this is the easy case, this makes sense to what we're thinking. It sloughs right during that supergiant phase. And then it depends on the mass of the thing. I mean, it a very, if it has a very high mass, you get a lot of helium burning in the shell, a lot of hydrogen burning, and your wind is strong, your pressure is stronger, and it can push it away faster. But if, it's, um, but if it's not so massive, not the case. So this is showing the, that you can be non-isotropic. Another one, the Eskimo Nebula, showing the same thing, the, the episode. So this is supposed to look like you know, somebody with a big furry you know, coat that's trying to keep warm in Alaska, type of Eskimo type of furriness around them. So here's the head and here's... The, so you can see one of these earlier episodes of mass loss through some type of wind, probably during the subgiant or giant phases. And then, you know, a little later mass loss here as well. So speaking to your question about how does this happen all together in episodes. Basically, in astronomy, we always want things to occur perfectly. You know, we always want everything to be spherical, everything to be isotropic, everything to look the same. But when it comes down to it, everything is incredibly different from the next. Here's one going back to something that looks more like what you'd expect, the Spirograph Nebula. You know, I'm old enough to remember when you can put a piece of pencil to a paper and you have the gear inside of the other gear and you run it around and it made a spirograph and that's where this comes from. I mean to buy one of those for my kids but actually hard to find. So this again is showing you the central object and you can actually see again another episodic mass loss here relative to this, this one here. But this is a more spherical um, nebula than we've seen previously. And so again I want to drive home the point that these are low mass systems. This is, ha this is what happens when you just have a little bit of mass, just you know, a couple solar masses or less. Stars are made with more than that, 10, 20, 30 times the size of our sun. So when those things evolve, different things happen. You don't have the slow wind pushing something away. You have an explosion. So this is no planetary nebula. This is a star ripping itself apart. And again, that happens through mass. And what, why would a star want to do this to itself? Now, what, what, what could cause it to even think that this is a good idea? And the, and the key to this, it happens in the core again. So in the case of those low mass stars, there wasn't enough mass to take those carbon nuclei in the core and condense them to a point where you could force heliums into them and create an oxygen or a few a carbon and an oxygen and create silicon. Notice that I'm naming off bits and pieces of the periodic table here because that's what happens. As you have a carbon core, one of the things you're going to do is add a helium to a carbon. What do you get? An oxygen. If you have carbon and oxygen together, you can add carbon and oxygen together to get silicon. Maybe you want to throw a couple heliums towards an oxygen and make a magnesium. Notice the even numbers are what you end up with. So these things build up. You get these elements building up at the core and you go through different stages of fusion, just like we went from hydrogen to helium to carbon. 
Now you're going to fuse carbon, you can fuse oxygen, you can fuse silicon. And eventually, you have to stop. Because one of these things, one of the things that all these things have in common is that the mass per nucleon goes down as you go up the periodic table. So you have four hydrogen making a helium. That gives off mass energy again because the mass per nucleon, the mass per these four nucleons, is lower than the mass per these four nucleons. And that continues up through the periodic table until you get to iron. Now, as soon as you get to iron, you no longer get that effect. You can't put more nucleons into iron and have it weigh less so that you can get that mass energy. It's physically impossible. So that iron will not burn. It will not fuse. So it sits there as an inert, non-active core. But all around it, it has these shells of fusion going on. So imagine if you, we had a helium shell and a hydrogen shell, we're blowing off some surface already. This thing has a multitude of shells. Imagine the luminosity of this thing. If you noticed on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, the HR diagram showing all those stars, at the very top of those, those supergiants, this is how they're formed. This is how the big giants are made because you have all these shells of different elements burning. It really pushes out your layers to make yourself big, but also gives you a lot of luminosity. So these are huge, bright objects. So the problem with this star is that as the mass continually contracts and as it continually ignites different stages of fusion within its core, it basically walks down a dead end. It ends up with iron at the center. And it says, oh no, I'm, I'm stuck. You know, I, I can no longer produce the energy to hold up this gravitational contraction. All these layers want to come at me. You know, you, you get the star gets really tired. It can't hold it back any longer. And so the details of what happens there, I don't really want to discuss. But what you should take away from this is that since it can't be burned, the outer gravitational layers condense it to the point that it can't be condensed anymore. That the density cannot be taken to the next level. Basically, neutrons cannot inhabit the space that other neutrons are in. And at that point, a ton of neutrinos are created. And where do those neutrinos come from? Because electrons, it's the density is so high that electrons in the atoms are being forced into the nucleus to combine with the proton to create a neutron, giving off a neutrino. So in the flash, in an instant, this entire core gets turned into a bunch of iron nuclei, into a bunch of neutrons with this outward-going neutrino blast. And that outward going neutrino blast is the blast wave, is the supernova that blows away all these outer layers. That's the explosion. No, it's not the explosion you think of. It's not, you know, the, the M80 and you got a, a match up against a wick and you throw it and it explodes. You know, it's not that incendiary device that you think of when you think explosion. It's actually, wow, that's what causes that? <laughs> that doesn't sound that special. When you think about it, it's just a rebound that gravitational collapse can't go any further, and there's a rebound blowing it away. So that's what causes the explosion. And like I said, it leaves behind that big ball of neutrons. What's even more strange is that if the mass is very large, you do break the neutron pressure. You can force them together. But once you start doing that, you force all of the mass into a single point, into a singularity, and you create yourself a black hole. So, when a star lives, it burns hydrogen. As it's dying, it burns different things in its core. If it's not very massive, it can't burn more than carbon. It creates a planetary nebula and dies in a white dwarf. If it's a little more massive, it can burn up to iron in the core. Once it gets to that point, that iron gets turned into neutrons, which is an explosive process that spews out the rest of the material and ejecta. If it's even more massive, you break that neutron pressure, 
you force them into one another, and you create yourself a black hole. So I'm not going to dwell on the compact objects that are within the cores. I think Professor Phil Carrot in the last IW, or IYA talk talked about black holes. But what I'm more interested in is the stuff that's going out, that explosion. Now what does that look like? What are these supernovae doing? So you might ask yourself, why do we care? Why do we care about supernova remnants? You know, why aren't you trying to you know, find a cure for cancer or, or you know, out digging a hole or building a bridge or something? <laughs> and one of the reasons is that those jobs don't pay as well. <laughs> Actually, they probably do. Um, <laughs> but one of the answers is, why, why are we here, here to begin with? Where did the carbon come from that's making the cells that make you up right now? All came from the center of a star. The phosphors in your DNA that are creating the bonds and the sugars that make the double helix, the adenine, thymine, the G's and the C's, all those putting together to replicate your cells, to make your babies, to go on. Those are all being created, all those atoms are being created at the center of a star. So everything in here, perhaps besides some of the hydrogen, and maybe some lithium, blah, blah, but nearly everything in here was created at the center of a star. So, I mean, that's really all I'd have to say. But of course, there's other things that are interesting as well, because explosions in a galaxy move things around. When you blow up a star in the middle of a galaxy, you're putting a lot of energy into the galaxy. Did you know that when a supernova goes off, it's brighter than the entire galaxy it exists in? It's a huge amount of energy. And so that amount of energy going off into the local interstellar medium shakes things up a lot. So that supernovae really dominate the mechanics inside of a galaxy. The dynamics of things moving around, they can really influence that greatly. And of course, they enrich the local medium, which is an important point. So when you study supernovae, you study not only stellar life and stellar death, but you also study stellar birth. Because as that supernova explodes, and it puts off those elements into the local medium, there's a big shock wave that goes out from it. So this is a supernova remnant here that blew up and there's a big shot going out. But notice, it's hitting this dark cloud here. So that dark cloud is a molecular cloud probably. It's just very dusty, dense cloud. And that is where stars are born. And typically a molecular cloud like this might just sit there for all time and not do anything. Happy in its stasis, happy where it's at. However, a supernova passes by and says, I'm going to condense you. I'm going to make you gravitationally collapse on yourself. You're going to form yourself some new stars. Not only that, you're going to form yourself some new solar systems around those stars. And those systems are going to be enriched by the minerals, by the atoms that you're giving it out of that supernova. So this says a lot about not only how stars live and die, but possibly can give us some insight into how stellar systems, solar systems are formed, and if the enrichment is dependent on what type of planets you see. So for instance, our sun, five billion years old, where the universe is probably around 15 billion years old. Now our solar system wasn't the first one formed. If it was, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have the elements necessary to form us. We're an nth generation star. Now who knows? We do know there had to be a lot of stars in a local vicinity, vicinity creating these atoms, blowing up, enriching the medium, shocking that medium, recondensing it, making more stars, making our solar system. And so when you study supernova remnants, you can get an idea of how that's being done. And in fact, when we take a close look at some of these interactions, these close looks at these shocks, we can actually measure the amounts of carbon that are in that shock, how much oxygen there is, and what that would mean for a system for stars that are formed there
versus how our own star was formed? Very interesting questions. So obviously, when you study supernova remnants, you can, you can answer a multitude, well, start asking at least, a multitude of questions that deal with you know, everyday thought and how we live here on Earth. But <clears throat> how do we see these supernovas? So I've, I've thrown up a couple pictures of, of supernova. How many people in this audience have ever seen a supernova? So you've seen a supernova, OK? Yeah. Which one? The That's awesome. I wish I was you. <laughs> Where were you at the time? Oh, that's great. That's really great. Um, I was expecting zero hands, but I thought in the back of my mind someone would see 87. In fact, we've seen thousands of supernova. It's thousands of supernova. Most recently, though, because we've been looking for them. And since we've seen thousands of them, and we can estimate how many should happen because we have a good idea of how stars live and die in our galaxy. And in our galaxy alone, we should see a few occur every 100 years or so. So I'm going to tell you a couple things. You've got, you got a few should occur every 100 years. Given that, most of us should have seen one in our lifetimes in this, in this audience. But then I just said we've observed thousands. Well, those thousands that we observed, they've all been in other galaxies. So when you take a look at our galaxy, we're really due for one. No one in here has seen one in our galaxy because 1987 was in the Large Magellanic Cloud a galaxy that actually goes around our galaxy in the local group. So when we take a look at remnants locally in our own galaxy, you know, most of us should have seen one in here, but nobody has. We can infer the presence. We can tell that a supernova probably happened because we can see the remnants of it. We can see the old explosion. We can see this hot gas filling up a spherical volume and say, oh, that must have been a supernova there. We didn't have to observe it, but we can tell that that's what happened. But we have seen a couple. We have seen a few. So if I tell you that there should be three every hundred years, and that we see thousands in other galaxies, and this gentleman's seen one himself, how many naked eye supernova do you think humans have recorded in history? Just throw some numbers out. 10, 5, 3. You guys are good. A lot of people would say, well, maybe 100, maybe 50. And the answer is 7. So in all of recorded human history, humans have only bothered to write down seven times where they saw a bright new star in the sky. So that's how a supernova would look. It would it would show up as a new star in the sky, it'd be extremely bright, and then go away after the course of days or weeks. And so ancient astronomers looked at the sky all the time. And so I actually doubt that they missed very many of these. Maybe we had you know, some preference to which hemisphere they're in. But I doubt they missed very many of them because they were looking for them. And we're looking for them still. And it's curious that we've only seen seven. So it's very appropriate, since it's the International Year of Astronomy, to go over the history of these observations. So what, has, what have humans done to observe galactic supernovae? Well, these supernovae, you'll note, are named based on the date that they were recorded, AD. So supernova 185, excuse me, was seen in 185 year AD, and 393, etc. So this particular, now when I say, this isn't the picture that the Chinese took, obviously. <laughs> they, they took very careful observations of the position. And then we saw their observation when we looked back at their notes and pointed a telescope at the sky at that point. And by golly, there's a supernova remnant. That must be the remnant to that explosion. So are 100% that this is the particular explosion that created that bright spot in the sky. Well, not 100%, but it's a pretty good guess. And for all intents and purposes, that's what we're going to go with tonight. So this was recorded by Chinese astronomers. This is the first time they referenced the Nova as a guest star, a star that came as a guest and then went away over time. 
And this is actually alluded to in Roman literature, which is debatable by many. This supernova here, 393, this was about 10 to 100 times brighter than Jupiter in the sky. So extremely bright. I mean, if you go out on dusk tonight, or you can't do that anymore tonight, go out to dusk tomorrow if it's clear, you'll see Jupiter far before you see any stars. You'll see Jupiter when the sun's on the horizon. So Jupiter is very bright. Imagine this 10 to 100 times brighter. So there's two of them. And notice their dates, 185, 393. Then you have to take a step. And that's a few hundred years before we see another one. And this is a very special supernova, supernova 1006. Anybody know why this is a special one? I don't expect you to, but it'd be nice. What's that? It was visible during the day. Yes, this was the brightest recorded supernova ever. Well, it's not hard when we only have seven to go from, but this one was <laughs> the brightest. And not only was it recorded, was it visible during the day, it was visible for weeks during the day. It was so bright that it cast shadows during nighttime. Yeah, this was the third brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon, 100 times brighter than Venus. This thing was blazing, extremely bright. And this is it. And this particular picture is really cool because it shows what you'd expect out of a huge explosion. It's, I mean, it almost looks like one of these Michael Bay made types of movie explosions of things coming out in this really cool cloud. And that's what you expect from a supernova. You know, astronomers like to make things spherical, and that's what you see here. But notice how it's kind of you know, indented on this half. It's kind of squashed. And that's indicated even more by this yellow ribbon, which is optical light. So you can actually watch this is a very young supernova when we're talking about supernovae, because even though it's you know, a thousand years old by our accounting, a thousand years is nothing astronomically. So this is a very young explosion. And we're now just witnessing the first time that this spherical blast wave is running into some local gas. So you can't see that local gas, but you can see its effect on this supernova as that spherical shock wave gets bent in here. So this is a really cool supernova for several reasons. Not only does it show you those early stages of the explosion, but also shows you that object which was so bright in the sky. Yes? In 1006 AD. How big is it? How big is, what do you mean? This here? Well, this is a combination of Hubble and Chandra images. So this is on the order of arc minutes. I don't know the exact size of this. Yeah, it's not arc seconds, it's not degrees. It's in the arc minute category. So for those of you who don't know, a degree, um, there's 360 degrees in a circle, and an arc minute is 1 60th of one of those degrees. All right, so if you, if you turn around, you have 360 degrees of space that you could possibly look at. Now if you divide those degrees into 360 bits, that's a degree. Divide that into 60 bits, that's an arc minute. So a very small, small piece of sky. Oh, yes, by far, yes, yes. We'll get to some things that aren't smaller than the moon, but one of the keys here is that these are very young. They haven't had a whole lot of time for that blast wave to make it big. Right? So it's, that's why. They will get big. They will get big. This is an interesting one, too, Supernova 1054. Anybody know what this is commonly referred to as? Crab Nebula, Crab Nebula there. And you can notice the pulsar right here because this purplish blue emission is from Chandra, and the, which is an observatory that observes in the x-rays, whereas the rest of this emission is in the optical. And it's probably the burning ejecta from that star as it's leaving the explosion very rapidly. And here's another one, an 1181. And here it is again in the x-rays. looks very similar to the Crab Nebula, again recorded by you know, the Chinese, the Japanese, Europeans, Middle Easterns. 1609 is when Galileo started observing with the telescope. This happened in 1572. Anyone want a fairy guess on who this is named after? Tycho. There you go, Tycho. He's getting them all. <laughs> yeah, this is Tycho. And Tycho was the, well, he wasn't the first to observe this, or wasn't the one to observe it the most, but it was given his name. 
Um, Tycho was the greatest naked eye astronomer ever because he did the most precise measurements of motions of the moon and the planets and the sky against the background stars. And most of that was to determine, well, where are we in the universe? You know, is the sun at the center? Is the earth at the center? How is everything moving? So he, had, he wanted to do meticulous observations. He was very bothered by the fact that the models they had at the time couldn't represent what was going on. So he's looking at the sky all the time, but not with the telescope, but with very fine naked eye observational equipment. And he studied this a lot, and we gave it his name. This is the last one. I'm not going to let you answer. So if, this is, if that was 1572, and you go 32 years later, and this is 1604, who do you think this is named after? A hint, it's not Galileo, a second hint. He had something to do with Tycho. Kepler. Kepler, very good. Yes, Kepler's. So it's strange that a, a, a mentor and a student should both observe two of the seven supernova ever in human history. But this is the last one, 1604, Kepler's supernova remnant. Again, you're looking at a mixture of X-ray light. And last one that we've seen visible by the eye, and last one that we've seen in our galaxy, period. Oh, in, our galaxy. in our galaxy. Remember, these are galactic things. So 1604, 1609 is the International Year of Astronomy. It's very strange that these things should shut off as soon as we start looking for them. As soon as we put telescopes on the sky, we no longer see any supernovae. It's very interesting. They're hiding from us now. So... Those are the ones that were seen by the naked eye. And we haven't seen any since. So do we just study those? No, because again, we can infer their existence by looking for them in our galaxy. And so if we find something, it must be an older remnant because we didn't see it before. And when, sure enough, we can take a look at these and see that they are older. So are there older remnants in our galaxy? How do you find them? You might have noticed that all those pictures had some X-ray emission in them. And if you didn't notice, it's probably because I didn't tell you, but they did. There's a lot of X-ray emission in each of those photos. And so this shows soft X-ray emission, the, 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 the longest wavelength X-rays that there are. <clears throat> and if you take a look at these X-rays, and you take a look at the sky, the entire sky, this is where our galaxy lies, right here, along this plane. What's that? No, it's just that the x-rays don't propagate through the dust and the clouds of our galaxy very well. And so you don't see a whole lot of emission there. But if you start looking out of the plane of the galaxy, where there's more open sky, you see a little bit more of that emission. And what happens, we think that a lot of this emission up top, red being strong and dark blue being weak, that a lot of that emission is hot gas that's being pushed out there by explosions that are pushing it out to higher galactic latitudes above the plane of the galaxy. Or perhaps it's really big stars like O stars and B stars pushing out hot gas with the wind. But notice that in the plane there is some emission, some very strong emission. These guys right here, these are two supernova remnants. These are older supernovae. So let's take, a, I'm going to take a closer look at these two just for example. And here's the first one, this one right here. It's better known as the Vela supernova remnant. So Vela is in this mess called the Gum Nebula, which is this huge, huge degrees across thing. The Vela Nebula itself is eight degrees across. All right, so eight degrees, the sky is a lot. Your fingers outstretched is about a degree. So eight degrees, the sky, this thing would cover if you could see it with your eyes. So sure enough, this is an optical photo, but it, I mean, that's staring at it for a long time, something that your eye can't see. And so you look in the optical, you see this filamentary structure outlines where that blast wave is hitting some local gas. And here's the X-ray emission from it. And if you look at the X-rays, you actually find another little guy. This is actually called the Puppis supernova remnant. So one that was hiding there the whole time. And in fact, if you looked at the hard X-rays, not the soft ones, the hard ones, you actually find another supernova remnant right here. Those actually don't have any physical coincidence, and they actually have different distances. But this gum nebula is a mess. The, the closest nebula to us in this nebula is about 500 light years. But then that nebula stretches for another 1,000 light years behind it. So a massive amount of galactic space filled with hot gas created by these supernovae. 
So now this is starting to show you how supernovae can really dominate the dynamics and the system max of what's going on in the galaxy. The other one's the Cygnus Loop. Some of you might know this better as the Veil Nebula. You, you train your eye in the Veil Nebula, typically you're looking at this right here. So for you amateur astronomers, if you have an O3 filter, take a look at the Veil Nebula right here. It's in the constellation of Cygnus, and it's extremely beautiful. So this shows up in optical quite well, and this is about three degrees of sky across. So another big remnant filled with a lot of hot gas as indicated by this X-ray emission. And why is this a particularly interesting remnant? Because we study it here, and the way we study it is through the use of sounding rockets. So who here has heard of a sounding rocket? A lot of you should because, you know, the, the birth of sounding rockets was Van Allen. I mean, the initial science done on a rocket was done by James Van Allen. And it's still being done today. So University of Iowa, in collaboration with the University of Colorado, are building these things. And Ted Schultz here, Mr. Ted Schultz, he's an engineer that, uh, when I was at Colorado, helped build this rocket and has helped building ones today as well in this collaboration. So rockets are pretty cool. Here's what we make. This is the X-ray payload. It has some optics that focus the X-rays onto some gratings that focus it onto some detectors. And this payload lives right here in this white box. And we put it in a white box, so that white box is styrofoam, and it controls the temperature in the desert because we launched them out of White Sands Missile Range down in New Mexico. So White Sands Missile Range, the birthplace of rocketry in America. So there's actually an old V2 sitting up there all refurbished. It's actually really cool to go look at. So what are our rockets like? Well, they're 60 feet tall, about six stories. So the tip would be right outside my window up on the seventh floor. And here's our payload, and there's two stages. Here's a, what's called a Terrier Mark 70 booster. These are surplus from the Navy. So these shoot off cruise missiles, typically, and we use them to shoot up science, very akin to what Van Allen was doing in the early days. This is a Black Brant VC sustainer. This is made by Bristol Myers Squibb up in Canada, and these are one-time things. You get a launch, you get funded for it, they make you a booster, and off you go. So two stages. This thing fires just for six seconds. I'm going to show you a movie in just a second. And it reaches 13 and a half Gs. Now, that might not sound like a lot to some of you, but you know, humans will die under sustained 4G pressure. 13 and a half Gs is tremendous. That amount of force can really break a lot of stuff. So you have to really make these things very robust. It's not a gentle ride on the shuttle going up to the Hubble. You know, this is a really bang em up job. And in fact, the interesting story is that on this section here, which I'll get to describing, there's a bunch of what we call umbilicals, a bunch of connectors that give electrical power and gas and all types of power to the system. And they're connected by these connectors, and then they have a really strong bungee cord holding onto them. And that really strong bungee cord, you take the bungee cord that's sitting in your garage wall, and you multiply that diameter by a factor of three or so, and that's that bungee cord, stretched taut. And so when this thing lights off, this booster, it leaves, and that connector pulls out just because the rocket's leaving. But now you have that bungee cord, which is basically a big spring that wants to bounce back, and you think to yourself, hey, that's going to get in the way. You don't want these you know, fins to get wrapped up in the, all these bungee cords because there's so many of these connectors. This thing leaves so fast that by the time that really strong top bungee cord comes back, the rocket's gone. A huge amounts of thrust, and you'll see this when I play the video. So what goes into the rocket? We have our payload here again. Here's the booster. This is a crush bumper. That'll be important in just a second. This is the telemetry system, a bunch of antennas that send the data back to ground. This is the guidance system. Notice these little fins called canards. They fire very rapidly, 60 hertz, to make sure that you don't land on I-25. Basically, they keep you in the range to make sure you go from point A to point B as planned. Point B is only 40 miles north in the range, but we get up to an apogee of about 250 kilometers. So it goes up, does six minutes of observation during its parabolic trajectory, and comes back down. So this isn't one of these big things that go up, goes up in orbits and observes whatever you want. You have to do whatever you can do in 360 seconds. 
You can do as much as you have time for, as much as your science allows. But right here you have a celestial ACS, an attitude control system. So that'll slew you around the sky wherever you want to go. But for x-rays, typically you want to look at targets that are only 90 degrees away from the sun because you don't want backscatter of x-rays coming down. And you also don't want air glow coming from the earth. So you are limited by what time you're observing during what month, what sky you're looking at, just like you would be for an optical telescope. So this ACS again, and that has a limited amount of gas, so you can't just spin up there endlessly. And then there's this thing called the ORSA, the Ogive Recovery System, which is a really fancy name for the parachute. So that parachute lives right here, and that parachute can take 1,250 pounds from that parabolic trajectory back into the atmosphere and stop it. And that's where that crush buffer comes in. Like I said, that'll become important later, which is now. Because when that parachute comes down, it hits the ground, that crush bumper compresses, hopefully saving your system and saving it quite a jarring. But the one thing that crush bumper doesn't do is account for winds, because these parachutes are so large, they're kind of like sails. And so on a windy morning, when these things that are coming down, or a windy evening as they're coming down, you can actually get your, your rocket drug across the desert floor for a long, long time before it decides to settle down. So here it is, without further ado. Now pay attention. I told you guys, 13 and a half Gs, it goes really fast, and it's gonna. So when I hit go, it's gonna do the last 20 seconds of countdown. I'll play it a few times. It's just the last 20 seconds of countdown. You'll see a flash, and that's it. So don't blink, or you seriously will miss it. That's the first stage. That's the first six seconds. That thing is up in space by right now. So it's, it's funny, that, that first stage actually isn't connected to the rocket. It slipped into it. And after that, as you notice, the second stage didn't go off right away. It waits. And after this gets done firing, after it has no more thrust, atmospheric drag pulls on the back fins, releasing it from the payload. Then the sustainer goes off. It's a funny story because the person that you can hear there, that's the photographer's assistant. So when you go down to a launch, you're assigned a NASA photographer. On the missile range, you cannot bring a camera. They will literally tackle you if you, they see you have a camera. Um, basically, they don't want you taking pictures of antennae that they have on the radio base, so they, or on, on, the, on the Army base, so that you can you know, reverse engineer what frequencies they're listening to or transmitting. And so they don't want you to have any cameras, but the photographer basically follows you around. And when you get assigned the photographer, literally, you can, you'll be walking around and they'll be there right there like your shadow. And you can tell them to take pictures of whatever you want. You know, how about that chair? You know, take a picture of this monitor. And he'll just sit there and snap pictures all day long. So it's actually really cool that way. And another cool thing is that you can become the photographer's assistant, which Mr. Ted Schultz has done before. And it's a big deal because if that rocket decided not to go right, if it didn't go, if it went wrong, and exploded on the rail, which happens before, um, those two people would not be with us anymore. And so, because <laughs> they actually stand right outside of what's called the blockhouse. And the blockhouse is three feet of concrete with two feet gl thick glass windows that are just slits. And they're that thick for a reason. Those people are okay that are inside that blockhouse, but the two that are outside watching it aren't, aren't so, aren't sitting in a good situation. But evidently it's thrilling. We actually watch it from a mile away. <laughs> Not by choice, but by force, because that's where uh, uh, this, this thing called uh, N200, which is where we control the rocket once it's up in space, that we can send commands to, to slew around if we want to, to make sure all the voltages are good, to make sure all the housekeeping is good, to make sure that the thing is operating like it should. But we watch it from a mile away. I actually like that, you know, that perspective. You get to see it go up, you get to see the parabolic trajectory, you get to feel the blast wave come over you seconds later. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And we usually stipulate how much time above 150 kilometers do we get, because that's kind of the break where you start absorbing some x-rays in the atmosphere. And so once you're above 150k, you're good to go for observation, and again, that's about six minutes. And in fact, I wrote my thesis on 103 photons. 
So what do we find from this? We found that, you know, supernova remnants aren't exactly what we thought they were. So this is what we looked at on the Cygnus loop. And when we took a look at the data, we said, hey, you know what? This remnant isn't as old as we thought it was. These remnants might actually evolve a lot faster than we think. That they might, might not put as much energy and matter into the local surrounding medium as we thought and that these things might evolve very rapidly and not have as big of an impact as we thought. So it's very interesting conclusions that we're coming to given some of these results, not only from these sounding rockets, but other X-ray data as well. One thing that I wanted to uh, mention is that that same rocket is actually being launched this Friday. Ted and I actually have a flight 6.30 tomorrow morning to go to White Sands Missile Range where we'll launch this rocket again um, Friday night. Um, there's supposed to be a uh, was it cold front? No, the jet stream is supposed to be parked directly over the rocket that night. So hopefully weather will change. Otherwise, we won't be able to launch. Because this is an interesting thing about launch. You'll be standing there, and it'll be not a breath of air. And in the crystal clear skies, the most perfect observing night ever. And they will not launch you because 50 kilometers up, it's 300 mile per hour winds. Yeah. And that really puts a damper on your guidance <laughs> when you're trying to fight against those winds. So relaunch this Friday. Hopefully it goes well. Wish us the best. How much does the launch cost? So to build a science payload takes anywhere between half a million, if you're really savvy and don't really you know, expect too much out of it, to two or three million dollars. So you're averaging between you know, one and a half, two million dollars to build the science payload. Then it costs a couple million dollars to get the NASA team down there to put all the components together to do with the things that you can't get back. The boosters you don't worry about because um, they're a dime a dozen from the Navy. The most expensive part is the sustainer, which can run about a million bucks as well. So you're well wrapped up, you're looking at about five mil. And for me, I calculated about $6,000 per photon for my science experiment. <laughs> but they're good photons because they... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I wanted to wrap up with, with this summary. Um, supernovas are really cool. And for several reasons, hopefully, that were elucidated for you tonight. The most obvious of which is that's the reason we're here to begin with. But also because you know, they give me a job. And they're important to lots of astronomical phenomena. They're important to stellar evolution, to lives, to deaths, to stellar birth, possibly to solar system formation to x-ray astronomy in general. So that's all I have to say tonight. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it.